tonight we have Shatan Noir joining us. Um, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your works, which are numerous. I know you have a lot of um, books and magazines and everything out. Sure. So I am an author, I'm a journalist, and I also own uh, Squatch GQ magazine publications. So um, I'm either always researching or writing, sometimes sleeping, doing a lot of traveling. So um, my books are Lake Monsters and Odd Creatures of the Great Lakes, Mothman and Other Flying Creatures of the Midwest. I have a children's book called The Marvelous Misadventures of Tegan Gray, which features my little seven pound miniature pincher as she goes hunting for Bigfoot around our backyard. Um, it's all done with like real photography uh, of her in little costumes and in a, a Bigfoot mannequin. So that one um, is geared towards kids and uh, gives some information about, you know, how to go Bigfoot hunting and what to look for and stuff like that. The magazines, I have Squatch GQ Magazine, that's our headliner. And then there is Cryptozoology Digest, which features more of the scientific evidence collecting um, forensic science of the cryptozoology uh, research. And then Into the Liminal Abyss Paranormal Magazine that covers paranormal UFOs, haunted locations, weird strangeness, um, all that uh, interesting stuff that's, you know, falls into that category. And then the fourth magazine is Dinosauria and Prehistoric Creatures, um, which features interviews with paleontologists, articles about different dinosaur species, different prehistoric creatures, um, attractions that are going on around the, the country um, involving dinosaurs or prehistoric creatures that I personally have been to and can validate whether they're good, bad, in between. Um, so all the magazines are published quarterly. And so I give myself a little bit of break, but I will be adding another magazine this fall. And that one is Rock Island and Prospecting, mm. um, which will feature anybody who's into rock hounding or prospecting. Um, you'll have articles about gems, minerals, uh, metal detecting, um, fossil collecting, stuff like that, both from the, the, the natural point of view, the metaphysical point of view, um, some jewelry tutorials, uh, anything that has to do with rock hounds, uh, prospecting, gems, any of that. So um, that will be the fifth one that I add um, this fall. So then it'll be five magazines that are quarterly and for the four. So yeah, I just, you know, I get bored sleeping. So what can yeah. I say? Um, and then I'm always doing presentations for libraries, paracons, cryptozoology events. I also teach. Um, I teach two courses at two, uh, two different community colleges, uh, Kellogg's Community College in Michigan and Owens Community College in Ohio. And the two courses that I offer at various times of the year are the paranormal history of the Great Lakes and cryptozoology of North America. That's How many so times prolific. have you had to repeat <laughs> that series of things in interviews? That's excellent though, that you get to just devote your time to what you love. I mean, it's, it's so clear that you must love this. You oh, do yeah. so much work into it, research into it. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah, actually, my one of my first questions was: out of all the field of ex, out of all your fields of expertise, uh, which one calls you the loudest? Oh, geez, um, <laughs> I love my cryptozoology, but I also do a lot of paranormal investigations. Yeah. So it it really, I guess I enjoy it all. But you know, if if you were to ask me, you know, peas and carrots of of you know breaking it down of which. I'd like, um, I enjoy the lake monsters out of all the cryptids. Mm. Um, those are the ones that I, I, I like researching the most. Mm -hmm. um, just because there's, um, I would say that lake monsters, aquatic, you know, monsters are the, the Schrodinger's cats of the cryptid world because you can't prove that they're there, but you also cannot disprove that they're there. Because most of these bodies of waters will never be drained to the point where you can say, ah, definitively, there is a lake monster. Or definitively, 
there isn't a lake monster, but it could be another portion of the lake that you're not currently looking at. So um, to me, that's that's one of the appeals of the lake monsters is mm -hmm. you can argue with me all day, but at the end of the day, there's been so many eyewitness reportings that something has to be, you know, seen and we don't have an explanation for what that is yet. So I like my lake monsters. And then for the paranormal, um, you know, I do like my ghost stories. I, I, I enjoy a good ghost story that has no explanation to the end of it. So case in point, um, if somebody is telling me, well, you know, I used to live in this neighborhood and the house across from us we believed was haunted um, because every once in a while we'd see, you know, something moving through the house or we'd hear loud bangs and, but then you find out, oh yeah, there's a, there's a quarry behind it. And of course you hear a lot of bangs because they're always, you know, jackhammering and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I like those ghost stories where there's not an obvious reason mm -hmm. for the sightings that people are having and the experiences that they're having are totally original and not something that, you know, they, they heard from another location or a TV show or anything like that. So yeah. um, to me, those are the most interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that was like a few weeks ago, we did the Bridgewater Triangle because we both oh, grew yeah. up there. Um, you've heard of it, obviously. Um, yeah. That's just full of unexplainable everything. I mean, oh, yeah. Cryptids, paranormal. Yeah. It, like I had now, said, you guys, you guys have it a little bit easy. Your Bridgewater Triangle is mostly on land. Yeah. Our yeah. Devil's Triangles are over the Great Lakes. And it's like, yeah, you don't really want to go sailing out into those because no. it's this no. weird phenomenon that happens all the time. And I, for one, don't really, I love the Great Lakes. They're beautiful, but I don't trust the Great Lakes because. I've studied their maritime history for a very long time, and I've mm -hmm. seen how a perfect, beautiful, 85 degree sunny day can turn into a nightmare within hours. And, you know, people are, are caught at the mercy of the lakes, and it just does not pan out well for them. What is your favorite lake monster tale in the United States? Um, so I would have to say my favorite favorite is from Lake Superior and it's the great underwater panther in a bishu um, from Native American legends um, just because the, each tribe around the Great Lakes has a different name for him it's all very similar spelt mm -hmm. and and pronounced but each one has a variation on the name and he is just a very interesting creature all the the story and folklore that goes along with him um, and the fact that some people depict him as a, a cat-like creature, a giant panther, and some people depict him as more of a moose-headed dragon-type, you know, creature. So that variation right there, I find very interesting. And so to me, he is one of my, my favorites. And do you have um, one of your works? If you were to recommend one of your books to somebody, which one would be your favorite to recommend? So it really depends on what their interest is mm -hmm. because the Lake Monster book is all dedicated to aquatic monsters. The Mothman book takes a deeper look into historical reportings and eyewitness reportings and folklore of the flying creature phenomenon here around the Midwest. So of course, Mothman being the biggest one from mm -hmm. down in West Virginia, but we also have just as many reports of thunderbirds and gargoyles pterodactyls and all shapes and sizes of creatures in between that at some point do fly through the sky and you know people have had various sightings of these creatures so you know it just depends on what their interest is um i was going to start working on a third book of um bipedal creatures you know bigfoot dog man mm -hmm. stuff like that but then i i took over ownership of the magazine company and that keeps me pretty busy. We had discussed a few weeks back also Bat Squatch. Oh, okay. Would I I'm not sure like how much of like background you would know, but we were you mentioned um flying uh, flying yeah. cryptids. What do you believe that that 
actually. So that, you know, that one is one of those unique ones where you're not quite sure if it's an actual cryptid or if somebody is hoaxing or what the potential is. Um, I know it's described as being a very large creature, furry, mm -hmm. but with bat-like wings. Um, and it's been seen on top of buildings, flying through the air. But, you know, there's a lot of tech that people have access to. Like I was just, um, before I flipped on to the podcast, um, there was a, a post on Facebook that showed um, where somebody had taken a large drone and put a grim reaper on it and was chasing people with it so i'm like if you can if you can you know fake that and and do that then it opens up the possibility for mm -hmm. a lot of you know interesting yeah. things to to be seen and if, if people only get a brief glimpse of it then that adds more fuel to the fire whereas if you if you actually stand your ground and and you know do a scooby-doo and you pull the mask off the off the you know person then you're like ah so it was mr or old man peterson you know exactly yeah well, out of all your expeditions that you've gone on is there one that has a very special memory for you oh geez so i've been to a lot of places i will say as a whole wisconsin is pretty much the coolest place that um you can if you're a paranormal investigator if you're a cryptozoologist wisconsin has Every, just about everything you could ask for um they have you know the haunted locations they have the ghost walks they have lots of cryptid sightings but they also have um like three ufo festivals all in a different town that claims to be the ufo capital of the world so interesting they have vampire reports they have witch reports mm -hmm. um they have uh locations where you can go hiking along the Ice Age Trail, um, lake monsters in almost every lake, um, Wisconsin Dells, Baraboo, um, mm. Mount Horab, which is uh, their claim to fame is they have uh, wooden carved trolls all over the downtown area. And they're just very cool and they're all unique and different. And each store, each restaurant has their own troll. Um, there's just so many cool things in Wisconsin and it's like, come on, you couldn't even leave the, like some for the rest of us, um, you know, in the Midwest. So they, they definitely have, a, have more cool things there than, than they should be allowed to. Um, but yeah, plus they're, they're like the cheese capital of the world. Um, beer, I don't really care about, but yeah, cheese, come on, you know, yeah. it's, it's cheese awesome. and ghosts all in one place. Yeah. That's definitely. Yeah. yeah. I would have never thought Wisconsin would be the. Um, Hang on while I book my tickets. Hang on a second. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, they have, and you know, they have a lot of cool um, uh, paracons there. They have the Milwaukee Paracon. They mm -hmm. have Easter Bay Road Conference. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different cool um, places to check out. So, yeah, uh, I would say Wisconsin is one of my favorite places to go. Um, now I will I will cushion that with saying I hate driving through Chicago. Um, if you've never driven through Chicago, it it has its own style of defensive driving, um, and, and until you're used to it, you never let your guard down. Um, it it is crazy driving, uh, and it goes you know from Chicago through Gary, Indiana is all this you know crazy uh, defensive driving, and then you get into Wisconsin and you're like, huh people drive normally here. So um, that's the only issue with going to Wisconsin is you have to drive through Chicago to get there. Mm. It seems so worth it once you get there though with everything all in that one place. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Yeah. And cheese. And cheese, of course. And you mentioned um, you had a magazine dedicated to um, dinosaur studies, correct? Yeah, Paleontology, yeah. dinosaur. Yep, dinosaur, uh, dinosaur and prehistoric creatures. Um, and do you find that though that goes hand in hand with like a cryptid research? So knowing with, with those, with the dinosaur magazine and the cryptid magazines and my research, I have to draw a very thick line mm -hmm. because while there are 
prehistoric creatures and dinosaurs that people claim are cryptids and that they have encounters with to this day. If I approach any paleontologists with that, they will slam the door in my face. So I have to keep a very, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a thick line in between mm -hmm. those two. And when I'm writing articles or doing interviews for Dinosauria, I have to look at the fossils, the facts, and go from it that, yes, these are extinct animals, and valuing the paleontologist, you know, time and effort in the research to find out more about that animal from the fossil remains. Um, now, if there are, you know, becomes a scientific report that, hey, we found a plesiosaur type creature swimming in the water today, that opens up a whole new, you know, ballpark. As long as the scientists say, yes, this creature's mm -hmm. alive and we're doing studies on it, then it opens the door. But as long as they deny its existence, it becomes cryptozoology, and yeah. then mm -hmm. I I have to pursue it pursue it from the angle of being a cryptozoologist and what mm -hmm. eyewitness sightings have there been, what evidence are people you know claiming, and how logical would it be for a creature of that nature to be in the location that people are sighting it in? Yeah, that makes sense. It does. I I would have thought maybe knowing a lot of the background on like this type of fossil or um, this type of land mass or where you would find something would kind of go not quite hand in hand, but complement each other. You, you would think that, but it's it's definitely not the case. Um, paleontologists, they go to school for a very long time. They value their, their reputations very, you know, highly mm -hmm. and they don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> The, the only time they will kind of make an exception is if you get somebody who is interested in primates mm -hmm. and researching the primate family tree, because Bigfoot is a part of that family tree. And there is evidence that we did have upright walking bipedal hairy primates other than humans in the fossil tree. And that kind of opens up a little bit of a doorway of discussion. But if you were to say, hey, what do you think about, you know, dog man or, you know, uh, yeah. mothman or anything mm -hmm. like that, they would say, well, there's no evidence of it in the fossil record. So that is not something we talk about, something we research, and quite frankly, a waste of our time. So I have to respect both sides of, you know, the paleontologists, they don't want the reputation tarnished by opening the door and saying, you know, hey, it's possible that, you know, these creatures could have existed longer than what we thought their kill off date was. Um, it was a huge, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a huge launch of articles on the fact that a freshwater plesiosaur was found in the dried lake beds, river beds of Morocco. Mm -hmm. And that launched a huge, um, wave of articles because people turned around and applied it to Loch Ness because Loch Ness is fresh water and said, well, if in the fossil record there were freshwater plesiosaurs, then that means that Loch Ness could be a freshwater plesiosaurs. And immediately you could see all the paleontologists <laughs> regretting even like, you know, Suggesting. Like, you know yeah. uh, acknowledging the fact that this was, you know, now a known fact. And so now it's like you have to tread very carefully because you don't want any anybody's um, reputation to be tarnished mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, called out for it. And as much as I would love to say, hey, we're all, you know, researching the same things, but to, coming at it from a different point of view, you have to, you know, respect somebody's, um, you know, credibility and their schooling and their their job titles and not want to get anybody in trouble by saying, hey, this paleontologist over here said, because as soon as you come out and say that, everybody's going to run back to that source and be like, oh, could you tell us that exact same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. They don't want any cross-contamination, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> yep. I have not had a chance to check out uh, intro to hood magic, but I need to know what is hood magic, because I think Jess ah. might be a hood magician. So that, that is um, going back to when I used to teach a lot of pagan um, uh, 
metaphysical studies. Um, I practice primarily uh, um, hoodoo and folk magic. Mm -hmm. So I was at a convention a couple of years ago, a pagan one, probably 10 years ago. And they, in the bio, in the program announcement, they had, instead of put hoodoo magic, they had put hood magic. <laughs> and every day, everyone all weekend long was walking up to my associates and saying, what's hood magic? And they they were like, what are you talking about? They're, so they would show them in the program guy and they would just roll their eyes. And like, it didn't get, you know, this didn't get brought up to me until like late on the second day. Oh. And they're like, we just started telling people, cause I used to wear a black hoodie all the time. And they're like, we just started telling people when you pull the hood over your head, that's when you were <laughs> practicing hood magic. So, um, but to me, hood magic is a urban form of magic, very similar to um, hoodoo and folk magic, but it's realistically, it's using what you have available to manifest the results that you want from your spell work. So if you are living in the city and you don't have fields of, of magical herbs growing around you, you can go to the store and get the dried version of those herbs, usually in a tea, usually in a, um, a cooking blend and use that. Instead of having to go out, forage for the herb yourself, Make sure you have the right one. It's yeah. all with your, your intent and what is available to you. So the intro of Hood Magic is just a modern day approach to urban magic. Okay. Okay. That makes more I sense love, to me. Yeah. Now. I love yeah. that. It's more of the intent of the magic as opposed to yes. the, yeah. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we touched upon it earlier. Um, we had brought up with your paranormal um, background. Could you... Let us know what possibly was your most unexplainable paranormal experience to date. Um, so I've, I've had two that were quite interesting. And um, the first one is it's a public location. People can go to it. And I don't know if your results will be the same because mm -hmm. um, my dog is very unique and very um, uniquely patterned. But up in Mackinac City, uh, you know, that's on the state of Michigan, there's Mackinac City and then there's Mackinac Island. But in Mackinac City, there's a public restroom. And I had a very interesting paranormal um, activity there. I had to give the background origin story of this story. I had stopped in Mackinac City in uh, a couple of years ago in June with my mom. I was taking her back up to where she lives because she um, had flown down uh, for the weekend to do her um, school's family or her school's um, class reunion, her graduating classes class reunion. And so I was driving her, her German Shepherd, myself and my miniature pincher back up to where she is in Minnesota. So we had stopped at uh, Mackinac or City because she wanted to get taffy and fudge. That's a Mecca for taffy and fudge, saltwater taffy and Mackinac Island fudge. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and they have every flavor of the, uh, that you could imagine. Panucci? So we stopped. What? Do they have Panucci? I've never checked for that, but. Oh, if you get a chance, look for it. Yeah. Every <laughs> flavor of fudge and every flavor of, um, saltwater okay. taffy. Mm -hmm. I usually go for Rocky Road myself, but you know, I know other people, uh, you know, might like other flavors, but to me, Rocky Road is the best. Um. Mm -hmm. So we had gotten the fudge, we had gotten the taffy, and I, I had my little dog with me. So I took her into the public uh, restroom, into the one big stall, and we left there. Nothing was out of the ordinary, got on the road, and went up to Minnesota. Now, fast forward a couple of months, and I'm coming back home from Michigan Paracon, which is one of the biggest paranormal conventions around uh, uh, the United States. Um, it's up in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And I had stopped into Mackinac City because I told my, my family that I would bring them home fudge and saltwater taffy. And I also wanted to have a, a pasty dinner. Um, it's, it's basically like a um, pot pie, but as a turnover. Um, mm. And there's restaurants that serve them up there. So I, 
went into the public restroom and just as I was about to leave that exact same stall, a voice out loud and clear as day said, what, no puppy this time? Oof. Oh. Now, I reacted to it and I started to answer back, no, she's at home. And then I'm looking around like there's no security cameras. Wow. Walked out <laughs> into the bathroom. All the other stall doors were open. There was no other person in that bathroom. Wow. Holy mackerel. <laughs> the building but that it's in sits away from all the other storefronts. And there was nobody outside. So something remembered me, remembered my dog, and realized that I didn't have her with me. And what is just mind boggling about that is there are thousands of people who go through Mackinac mm -hmm. City every day because that's the gateway to Mackinac Island. And there are thousands of people there a day and it's open, you know, seven days a week. The ferries are run, you know, from spring to fall going out to Mackinac Island. And so something remembered me out of all those people. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. I that's love that. A, puts your hair on end. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, I had, and I, um, a great friend of mine is uh, Todd Clemmings from Mackinac Island, who does the ghost hunts and ghost walks there. And I told him the story. He's like, well, it could be the ghost from here or the ghost from there. And I'm like, ha, <laughs> that's not the point. The point is it remembered me. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, they do that sometimes. And I'm like, so, you know, totally wasn't expecting it. And yet um, now we have this really interesting, you know, uh, experience where mm -hmm. I can't explain it. And I don't know who the ghost was um, because as far as I know, there's no ghost attached to that building. Mm -hmm. There could be some attached to the local restaurants and storefronts that are nearby, but it, it, recognized me immediately because I was only in that bathroom for maybe three minutes and so it recognized me immediately and wanted to engage and inquire about so where's your little dog at so it must have really liked my little dog I was going to say it uh, T Tegan is it correct yes Tegan. yep she, they made quite an impression the last time they were there with them well that well I have to wonder too if if his his presence was enough to keep it at oh. bay there he is. Oh my goodness. It's adorable. Oh, <laughs> As you can see, she's a Harlequin Minkin. She's got, you know, really cool markings and very, you know, unusual. You don't usually see Minkins with that coloration. Mm -hmm. um, they've become more um, like known in the last couple of years. But at that time, very few people knew what she was. Um, and very few dogs other than dachshunds had that marking. So it was, you know, something picked up on her and, and knew. So it was, that was very interesting. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. Animals do have that sense also, whether proven, yeah. unproven, whatever it is. Yeah, I, yeah they, they, do, they do pick up on things, which leads me into the next story of um, one that she was with me and we both picked up on something at the exact same time. Now, we had gone down to spend the weekend at the Mothman Festival, and we were staying at a friend of mine's cabin, and the upstairs of the cabin where we were staying was an open floor plan um, with rooms that um, kind of alcove. So there was like four different alcoves, and the stairs come up into the middle of the room. So on the first night, there was me, my little dog, and another lady st staying in the one alcove. And there was a, a bed on each side of the alcove with open space in between us. And there was a rocking chair in between us. So the first night, nothing really happened. We had some Bigfoot activity out in the woods um, and didn't really think anything of it because I'm focused on Mothman and, you know, um, going to the festival the next day. So spent the whole next day at the Mothman Festival, got back to the cabin, was exhausted by you know, uh, time, you know, night came and I knew I was getting up early the next morning 
to go hiking around um, uh, Hocking Hills um, State Park. So went to bed and around 2 a.m. in the morning, now I'm, I had set my tote bag on the rocking chair in the middle of the alcove. The other lady wasn't staying there that night. And at the top of the tote bag, I had a bottle of ibuprofen. So went to bed and I had my back to the rocking chair and my miniature pincher was in between me and the wall. And about 2 a.m. in the morning, I wake up because I have this icy feeling going through me. That feeling that you get just as you avoid an accident, that, that sensation that just floods your body, mm -hmm. just as I start to feel that sensation sweeping from my back through the front of my body, my little Keegan starts growling. And it's at that time that I hear the pill bottle, the bottle of ibuprofen, rattling back and forth. Oh, my God. So I'm laying there and knowing that there's other people in the house, knowing that there's, you know, people no less than, you know, 15 feet away. I'm laying there and I'm like, I, I want to roll over and see what it, <laughs> it, it is, but at the same time, I wonder what else it's going to do. And my phone was on the nightstand behind me and I don't, didn't have a mirror or anything. So all I could do was listen. And after about a minute or so, it was so quiet that I was like, okay, it must be gone now. So I, I eventually turned back over and there was nothing, nothing there. So the next morning, um, there was a mother and daughter who were staying in the El alcove um, next to where I was. And uh, they were getting up and I said, oh, are you guys okay? I heard you getting medication last night and I didn't want to um, uh, invade your privacy. I, I was just, you know, are, are you guys okay? And they said, oh, we didn't, we weren't getting any medication. We thought that was you rattling your pill bottle back and forth. I said, well, something was rattling the pill bottle back and forth. And it's at that time that they told me, oh, oh, he didn't tell you this, this cabin's haunted by a little boy. And I'm uh -huh. like, Oh, nice. That that need to know information, you know. Yep. Uh, so that was that was another very unique, very interesting situation where um, wasn't expecting activity, but it it decided to interact in its own way, and it was like, man, I wish my phone had been like you know where I could slowly like raise it up over <laughs> my shoulder and on selfie mode and see what was behind me. If anything was behind me, you know, because uh, I don't know if it was a full apparition. I don't know mm -hmm. if it you know, was just, you know, playing with the pill bottle. I don't know. So it's uh, that those are my two most interesting, um, you know, experiences where didn't even know the location was haunted and yet something mm -hmm. chose to interact with me. Yeah, from now on, I would ask at the door. So, is this haunted? Before I sleep here tonight, please. Yeah. I, it's like, gonna... I have to get my cell phone out now and charge it and make sure you know that it's exactly. A situation, you know, let me go get my dash cam or my body cam. <laughs> and, you know, put that on. You're from Michigan, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have lived in Michigan all of my life. Um, it's it's a nice state. I mean, people say that the winters can be too harsh, but to mm -hmm. me. I'd rather have that harsh winter for a couple of months and a mild summer than not being able to walk outside without like being drenched in sweat <laughs> in 115 degree weather. So, you know, hottest yeah, you signature is maybe 95 and that's if it's a really hot summer day and it usually only lasts for like a day or so and then it drops back down to the 80s. So totally livable. Um, you know, I like the four seasons. I like having a nice fall. Mm -hmm. Um, so to me, it's, it's, uh, I love my, my Michigan weather and I can always travel, you know, I can always, uh, uh, you know, take off and go someplace different. Um, now Michigan is like, would you say famous for dog man activity? So we do have, so the Michigan dog man mm -hmm. is, um, known around the Ludington area. But the Beast of Bray Road is also a dog man. 
because mm-hmm. um, werewolves really are only alive and well on movies. Yeah. It, it's almost physically impossible for a human being to transform from a wolf into a dog and then back. That's a major witchcraft or curse there. Um, and I don't think that you would survive it more than once or twice doing that transformation. Yeah. So the dog man is a creature that is an upright walking canine that stays in that form. Now, there's so much research dedicated to Bigfoot that people are just now realizing that, hey, um, that sighting we had, you know, Bigfoot doesn't have a tail. It doesn't have ears. It doesn't have a snout. And then they're like, huh maybe that was the dog man that we saw running across the road and not the Bigfoot. And we do know that they like the same type of territories. What we don't know is, is the dog man a natural occurring species or is it something that's interdimensional or extraterrestrial and just comes here to earth, kind of like predator yep. comes here to earth to <laughs> um, you know, take stock of our technology, hunts for you know, different species here. Um, looks for food sources, stuff like that. Um, plus, we, we have a quite a diverse canine population here on Earth, um, going anywhere from your little teacup Yorkies and Chihuahuas all the way up to your Great Danes and Irish Wolfhounds and St. Bernard's and Mastiffs. So there's quite a bit of different canine DNA. Um, and I'm sure nobody realizes if, you know, I mean, a family would realize when their dog goes missing, but um, how many stray dogs are out there running around that nobody takes count of when they're here today and disappear tomorrow? Mm. You know, they they are, you know, you've got different coat types, you've got hairless, Mm -hmm. you've got wire coats, you've got thick coats, um, like a husky or a Malamute, you've got the smoother coats like a Mastiff or a Doverman, Um, you've got the curly coats like the Poodles. So who knows what, you know, genetic DNA material appeals to a a breeding population. Mm. And so maybe they do come and breed with canines on this earth, go back, or maybe they just come here to, as a vacation to, to see how many humans they can scare out of the woods. (laughs) Um, You know, we really don't know. We don't know what their intentions are other than you are probably more likely to survive a Bigfoot encounter than you are a dogman encounter because it's the dogmen that you don't see that are the potential threat, not the one that you do see. And you would believe, you do believe, or you do think that they would be dangerous? Oh, yes. To a human? Yes. Okay. I, I think they are a predatory creature, and I do believe that they work in packs mm-hmm. because that is a a well established plan of attack for a predatory animal is to work in a pack whereas with the bigfoot usually you only see if you encounter them usually with primates you will see females with young in one area and a male that travels around the territory um servicing those females until Mm -hmm. a couple of generations go by and they chase out that male and they welcome a new male in because you want a a updated genetic base every couple of generations. Otherwise you start getting deformities and Mm -hmm. um, your, your likelihood of of surviving into the next generation is, is diminished. But with the, with the dog man, we see a pack behavior, just like with wolves, just like with coyotes, just like with, uh, stray dogs, just like with foxes, all of these canine type creatures work as a pack. You have your alphas, you have your subordinates, and then you have the, the, the in-betweens. Would you think that that would ever come to a clash? I know this is such a random question. No, but- no, because what a lot of researchers have discovered is once a pack of dogmen move into a Bigfoot territory, the Bigfoot leaves. Really? And this is usually because it is mothers with offspring, young offspring, Mm -hmm. that they, you know, a mother is going to protect her offspring. And when you're dealing with a pack type scenario, 
it's easier just to pack up and move to a different area than it is to try to protect your 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 whole family mm -hmm. from a pack. Um, and yes, that does mean giving up resources in the area, but in a a area like Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, even into Minnesota, um, there's always prey animals to to hunt and eat. Deer are are wonderfully stupid, um, and and are a good food source for Bigfoot or Dogman. And anywhere that you have farms, where you have cornfields, where you have fruit orchards. Um, any type of uh, edible crop that's being grown, you have the potential for Bigfoot and eventually dogmen to be in that area because the food draws in the deer, which draws in the Bigfoot and the, the dogman. And so we get a lot more reports from farming areas of the Bigfoot than we do the state parks or, you know, anywhere else because these fields can be huge. I mean, corn fields are, are massive, mm -hmm. but pumpkin fields are massive. Um, apple orchards, fruit orchards are massive. And if they wait until dark, they can have, they can eat whatever they want and, you know, disappear back into the woods and nobody's there. They can also hunt down the deer or wait for the deer to get hit by a car and then they drag the car just off the road and it's a free, easy meal. Yeah, and I would see a Bigfoot clan, I guess, as more of a, um, not peaceful so much as just not not as aggressive as a, right. a pack of yeah, dog so men would be. So this is how I, I put it to people. So that big hairy creature that you, you get a glimpse of on the path as it runs across the path and disappears into the woods, that's probably Bigfoot. That big furry creature that leans out from behind a tree or an outcropping of rocks and just stays there <laughs> and watches you, that's a dog man. And it's not that dog man that you probably have to worry about. It's the ones that are closing in on you from all other areas of the woods because no matter which way you run, um, I don't care if you're, if you're a uh, uh, track and field star, you're not going to outrun a one of these creatures. No, no way. If, if you can't outrun a pack of wolves, you're not going to outrun a pack of dogmen. No. Uh, they're bigger, they're faster, they can move through um, the woods, uneven ground, much better than you can, and they know the woods better than you do. So even though you've hiked that trail, you know, you don't know every inch of it, and just when you think, oh, I can flat out run, you're going to trip over a root or something like that or a rock. And once you go down, you're, you're not going to get up fast. And by the time you do, do get up, either it's going to be right there on you or it's going to be within a close distance. Mm -hmm. And it's just toying with you at that point. Yeah, that's like going into the ocean. You might be visiting it, but that is their home. Yes. And they're going to get you either way. Yeah, they know yep. every single little square inch of their own home. It's like, don't, don't go crying to anybody when Mr. Shark bites you yep. or, you know, the octopus, you know, grabs you or squid grabs you or the barracuda or anything else, because you're the one who went into their home. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, to you, it's all fun and games to them. It's life and death and, and, you know, hunting for, for food. Oh, have you had, um, personally, a dog man experience? I have not had a dogman experience, but okay. I am 100% sure that I had a Bigfoot sighting um, up in Minnesota. And I was coming home from uh, where my mom lives in Minnesota, which is Ely, Minnesota. And from Ely to the next big town, Virginia, it's just a two-lane two highway, co county highway. And then as you get near Virginia, which is about an hour away. Um, it, it, you go up an uh, on-ramp and you suddenly are on a four-lane highway. And right as I started going up onto the on-ramp, I was in a Jeep Wrangler Sport at the time, a soft-sided Jeep Wrangler Sport. <laughs> and I saw headlight, fog light, thick, furry, 
scruffy hair on a leg, which was a thick leg, tall grass that only went up to about the knee height of this creature, same thick furry leg, fog light, head light. <laughs> Wherever the head and chest of this animal was, it was higher than what my head was in the Jeep. Now, standing outside my Jeep, I could easily put my chin on top of the hood of my Jeep, which makes it about, you know, five foot because mm -hmm. I'm five foot eight. So wherever the head and chest of this animal was, was seven to eight feet up. Wow. So my, the top of my headlights caught the, the, the lower portion of the chest, the head and, and shoulders of this creature were above that. I got a good 15 in, uh, increment of, of uh, second, you know, sighting as I was driving up past it. And then I was up on the four lane going, huh, I should go back down and take a picture of it. Now, this was 14, 15 years ago. And back then, your cell phones were still the flip phones. That, mm. For what they were, they took a pretty good picture, but they weren't nothing like we have today. Mm, so right. I'm like, so do I cross the median, go down the off ramp, come back around and try to get a picture? And I'm like, that's a good idea. And then another thought hits me of, so how are you going to explain to your mom, <laughs> the state police, the tow truck driver, maybe the paramedics of how your Jeep got flipped off the on ramp it is now in the ditch and you know at 3 a.m in the morning they're gonna say you fell asleep at the wheel and i'm gonna be like no i saw bigfoot here's the picture and they'll be like well, what the hell is in that picture you know um so i i just continued driving on and um you know and then i've got like notions that bigfoot knows i it saw that i saw it now and what if it's chasing me what if it's calling out to other bigfoots in the area mm -hmm. And they're going to like set a trap for me. And I, um, you know, the way that your mind will, will mm -hmm. run with ideas, um, especially early in the morning. And I'm like, get to Duluth, cross the bridges over into uh, uh, Superior, Wisconsin. And once I'm across the bridges, I know those guys can't cross that bridge. And it would take them a long time to swim that. So I'm fine. Sometimes you're never sure because it is, in the end, it would be a wild animal and you can never know what that wild animal is going to do when you go back to try and see yeah. it or approach it. You can't, you can't tell, like, is it going to be happy with me? Is it going to pose for a picture or is it going to take off? Hey, I'm posing and then, oh, you know, there goes your, your Jeep, you know. Yeah, no, you can never be too mm -hmm. sure.